Those of you that have met and heard realize how whoops, <clears throat> incredibly lucky we are to have her and her experience. And uh, it's a real honor to kind of be here uh, with so many of you guys uh, to tell the story. And, uh, a few of you have met at past events. Um, we, were, we made an attempt to come to the UK uh, many years ago when Charity Water first started, but we never had, uh, we never really had anyone here to take up the I guess the banner and actually move things forward. So we're super, super excited to having Harrod and do that. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit about my personal story. I'll talk about water. I'll talk about the organization, tell a bunch of stories. I'm gonna show 150 photos, so it won't be boring. Um, I know there's a couple kids here, so that's for you guys too. And uh, then we'll tell you what our plans are and how we would love for some of you to get involved. A uh, little bit about my story. I was born in a middle-class family in Philadelphia. My parents, as you can see here, used a cereal bowl to cut my hair. <laughs> they thought this was a good idea. I didn't know any better. Uh, Mom and Dad loved each other. He was a businessman. She was a writer. And when I was four, we moved out to the suburbs. And this house that we had moved into, unbeknownst to our family, had a carbon monoxide gas leak. So we move into this house. Mom starts fixing it up, specifically the basement, and she starts to die. On New Year's Day, she walks across my parents' bedroom. She collapses unconscious. Uh, we take her to the hospital, and after a long series of tests, they find these massive amounts of carbon monoxide in her bloodstream. So fortunately for the family, she does not die, but her immune system is irreparably destroyed from this point on. And she becomes allergic to the world, allergic to anything chemical, from soap to the print uh, on books to car fumes. Uh, I watched as a child my mom go from this healthy, vibrant super mom to an invalid, wearing charcoal masks connected to oxygen, uh, forced to live outside so much of the time because the house made her sick. When she did come inside, she was living in a tile bathroom that was covered in tin foil, and she slept on a cot that had been washed in, with baking soda 25 times. So it was a bizarre childhood. Uh, family planning stopped. I was an only child. Uh, grew up really in a caregiver role, helping to take care of her. My parents had a very deep and authentic Christian faith. They decided not to sue the gas company for gross negligence. My dad had actually ripped out the furnace and found the, the fault. Um, but they didn't want to become bitter. They believed that you know, someday a sense would be made of this terrible tragedy you know, through their faith and through prayer. So I grew up as a very good kid playing by the rules. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't have sex. I take care of my mom <laughs> until the age of 18. <laughs> And then, darkness descends. <laughs> so I moved to New York City, I joined a band. Our band was actually good, but we hated each other. And I learned that the people that were booking our band, the people that were running the nightclubs, were the ones making all of the money. And I realized that if you could get the right fancy people inside nightclubs, you could charge ridiculous amounts for liquor. So this becomes my life for the next 10 years. Uh, filling up clubs with beautiful people selling $500 bottles of champagne uh, to people who sometimes didn't even drink them. They would just spray them in the club. <laughs> this is a picture of my life 10 years later. And I would like you to notice here what a pretentious, sad person I am here because I am actually intentionally holding out my Rolex watch so some club photographer <laughs> notices I have an expensive watch. <laughs> this is my business partner. Uh, we were. By all, I mean, people thought we were very successful. We were getting paid $4,000 a month just to be seen in public drinking Bacardi. And then Budweiser paid us another $4,000 a month to drink Budweiser, which we thought was not enough due to the quality of that product. But it, was, it, was a great, uh, it was a great life until really it wasn't. So um, after 10 years of this decadent living, uh, I'll paint a picture of my life when it was that photograph. I have smoked two packs of Marlboro Reds now for 10 years. I have a gambling problem, I have a drinking problem, I have a pornography problem, I have a strip club problem, and I have a cocaine problem. Pretty much everything short of heroin I'm doing at this point. And yet it looks very glamorous. So on the inside, I had truly become the worst person that I knew. And I kind of came to my senses in South America. I was on this vacation in Punta del Esta, and we had rented a huge compound with servants and horses. And my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines at the time, and I had a BMW and the Rolex, and I had a grand piano in my apartment, and I had a Labrador Retriever. <laughs> Every single thing I thought would make a man happy. And I realized that uh, I was emotionally bankrupt, I was morally bankrupt, I was spiritually bankrupt, and I'd really betrayed all the values that I had grown up with. So I began to 
Now, I'm parting a lot on this trip, but I begin to read deep theology during the day, hungover, um, and try to find my way back to a very lost faith and a very lost morality. It takes me a couple months, but in the summer of that year, I uh, liquidate everything that I own. I literally put my DVD collection of 2,000 up as a lot on eBay, and I make this deal that I'm gonna try to go relive you know, the faith of my childhood through service, um, I remember seeing a lot of hypocrisy growing up, a lot of things that really turned me off. But the idea of serving others and not myself was very compelling. And I wanted to go make my life look exactly the opposite. So I really wanted to serve the poor in, in a, a really desperate place. So I start applying, after I've sold everything, to the famous humanitarian organizations of the world. UNICEF, Save the Children, World Visions. And wouldn't you know it, no one will take me. <laughs> Because my resume is not exactly, uh, you know, what they're used to. And I'm getting these responses like, dude, we're serious people. <laughs> what have you been doing for the last 10 years? So finally, uh, one organization says to me, and I, I literally couldn't make this up. They said that if I was willing to go to this country and live in Liberia post-war, and if I was willing to pay them 300 pounds a month, I could volunteer. So I give them my credit card. And I grab a camera, I dust off a, a journalism degree that I'd gotten at NYU, and I said, look guys, I actually know a lot of people. I have 15,000 people on my nightclub list. You know, I've gotten these people drunk for 15 years. Maybe I can <laughs> tell them whatever your doctors are doing in Liberia, wherever this country is. I've never even heard of the country. So, life changes. Um, I should say, I go cold turkey. I quit everything in one go. Drink a little bit, but I never, never smoked again, never gambled again, never touched coke again, never looked at porn again. I was completely believed that I had to shed all of these vices um, to kind of open up this new chapter of my life and start a new story. So I quit everything. I did go out with a bang. I got very drunk the night before I had to get up on the ship and sail away. But uh, I really left it all kind of on the land and sailed in on this brand new adventure. So this was my new home. Some of you guys have heard of this organization. They have a patron here in the UK called Anne Glog, who's given them lots of money uh, and helped them build these ships. 522-foot uh, hospital ship, the best doctors in the world from 41 countries would volunteer their time and sail this thing up and down the coast of Africa and operate on people who had no access to medical care. So I'm very excited because we're going to be helping people. My third day there, um, well, first I, I travel into the, the city, I get off the ship and I see this country has really been through a lot. At the time, there is no electricity, no running water, no sewage, and no mail anywhere in the country. Charles Taylor has decimated this place after 14 years. We went in with 14,000 peacekeeping troops, which was the largest force at that time ever deployed in the world. Houses that were once beautiful you know, were completely just destroyed. So right before our ship had sailed in, an advanced team would put up these posters, these flyers, all throughout the country looking for patients. And we were specializing in massive facial tumors, flesh eating disease, cleft lips and cleft palates, and reconstruction, people that had been burned during the war, sometimes by the rebels. My third day on the mission, it's 5.30 in the morning, I grab two Nikon D1X cameras, I jump in a Land Rover, and we start rolling towards the football stadium the government has donated. And we're going to see who turned up. I know we have 1,500 surgery slots available, and there are 5,000 people who have come. I remember just breaking down. I'm standing on top of a Land Rover, taking this picture, just weeping, realizing that so many of these people who came with hope were going to be sent home. Learned that some of these people had walked more than a month from neighboring countries because they heard there were doctors and surgeons that might be able to help them. Get inside. The first child that has been standing out in line, his mom brought him three days earlier, is this boy named Alfred. He has basically been suffocating to death on his face with a benign tumor. This is his mom. His mom pulls out a photo and shows it to me and said, four years ago, my son was a normal boy. And then this tumor started growing, and there was nowhere to get him help. And here he is today. So I have my second cry, run in the corner, and I'm just, I lose it. I'm like, I've never seen anything like this before. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through a year if my job is to take pictures and, and interview patients with massive deformity. So um, 
I learn what we're there to do. And a couple days later, I scrub up. I see Alfred's amazing surgery. And I see these doctors from the UK, from Germany, who operate on him for free. And I see that this is what we're there to do. We're here to impact people's lives every single day. I get to take him home a week later with his new face, and I get to watch him heal. And it was truly a place of miracles. I would wake up in the morning. I would go meet the patients of the day. This one uh, amazing woman, her name was Martheline. And she told me that this tumor had grown over eight years, and she used to carry a towel in her hands because if she didn't cover her face, people would stone her. They would throw rocks at her. They thought that she was cursed. She had done something evil, and she needed a 40-minute surgery wow. just to remove the benign tumor. So this was year one. I took 50,000 photos. The whole time, I am emailing these photos back to my club list, which gets a little smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, dude, I signed up for that Prada party you threw once, not the tumor party. Like, <laughs> leprosy, what? Um, in all seriousness, many people began to actually give. I remember getting an email from a woman at Chanel once saying, I'm sitting here in the middle of the office, tears are streaming down my face uncontrollably. I, I didn't know that this existed. I didn't know that there were women my age who were living like this and that I could actually help. So I realized these, these stories, these, uh, these photos were a bridge to people who wanted to help and could help and could provide the money alongside the doctors who were providing their time. So I signed up for a second year, uh, just not knowing what's next for me. I start spending more and more time in the rural villages, and then I come across lots of dirty water. I had never seen people drink from swamps before, and I learned that more than half of the people in this country had no clean water to drink, and they were drinking from swamps and ponds and rivers. I met this teenage girl named Hawa Blobon. And she told me this was the water she'd known her entire life. To put this in perspective, I was selling $10 bottles of Evian and Voss to people who wouldn't even open them. They would come into the club, buy 20, and just leave them there. And people were drinking, kids were drinking from swamps 